Yeah, so since uh, everything, uh, this case, this the second part of the summary, we covered uh, synchronous generator, we covered synchronous motor, then we covered induction, induction, uh, we covered induction motor. Now, generator, as far as induction generator, induction, well, we'll talk about it. Which I'm just going to mention the motor here because uh, most of the time the induction machine is going to be used as a motor. Sometimes uh, if, it's, uh, if it's arranged or produced in a different way, it is, it can, uh, you can actually get some power back from it. So you can use it as sort of like a generator, but I'm just going to mention a motor. So induction motor, uh, so that would be three phase, uh, three phase. I don't want to use the this symbol here, three phase. All right, and then uh, we cover the induction motor single phase. All right, so that's pretty much what we have covered. What we haven't covered yet uh, is the stepper motor um, and variable frequency drives and there was something else that we haven't covered so i'm going to i'm i think i'm going to have to cover i'm, I'm going to have to work extra hard uh this weekend so hey you know what when you're going to enjoy your studies uh, during the weekend or sometimes maybe you're going to go and have a good outing uh, i'm going to uh, put my uh, nose to the grindstone and um and just make sure that you get the that you get the content that uh that needs to be covered. Uh, and I'll release that thing with uh, in a video format here. Right? Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what we've covered. Synchronous generator, synchronous motor, and then induction motor, uh, three phase and a single phase, right? So we'll quickly, uh, is it going to be multiple choice? I'm still deciding what is going to be. If I do a multiple choice, then I'm going to have to come up with different sort of versions. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, have a little bit of math question, math related questions. So some of the calculations are going to be included, which means if I do it a multiple choice, then I'm going to have to come up with uh, different versions. And when you do the calculations, they, they will have to be sort of exact up to a point. <clears throat> or if I do the fill in the blanks, uh, then uh, if I do the fill in the blanks, I don't really like do the fill in the blanks uh, questions when it comes to online testing, because um, when we do that, uh, if somebody just uh, misspells a word or something like that, then it's, uh, then it's marked wrong. So if I do fill in the blanks, then um, I'm going to have to mark those tests manually. Even though it's going to be online, I'm going to have to open every single one of them. And I think it's doable. Uh, uh, there's no, we don't have like 200 people class. Um, and even if there were, they'll have to do it anyways. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's either that or, or both, okay? So I might, I might ask you a, a specific question and I'm going to ask you to describe, uh, you know, the power flow in certain mother, all right? Or I'm going to ask you uh, to describe uh, um, the difference between uh, synchronous motor and, uh, and the, some differences between synchronous motor and synchronous generator or synchronous motor and induction motor, uh, things like that. And uh, I, even though I'm going to uh, say fill in the blanks, Yes, you're going to just have the space to write what you do, but that I will not have that thing to be automatically test, uh, marked. I'm going to have to um, uh, open every single test and give it the mark myself based on that. Uh, which means that once you push the button that says submit the test, you are going to not get the mark yet until I open it and check it. Okay, so if that's the case, I'll, I'll let you know. I think I, I'll do the second one. I think I'm going to have to, uh, it's going to be better if I mark it manually. All right. Uh, a little bit more work for you. Sorry, a little bit more work for me, but, uh, um, but I think it's going to be a little bit more efficient uh, as far as uh, uh, well, more beneficial for you. Okay, because it's going to give me a little bit more freedom of asking you the questions certain ways. Uh, all right. Also, uh, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. So with all the theory lessons, uh, so with all the video uh, video uh, that we have on YouTube, the posted uh, video lectures, uh, then uh, the posted lecture notes that are on FOL, 
And also uh, what is going to be is the knowledge that we have gained during the labs, okay? Um, so those three things, you will have all the materials at your disposal. You can talk to anyone, you can consult any materials, you can talk to each other. Uh, while you're doing this, you're still learning. Uh, and that's, that's my main objective. The only thing I'm going to ask you to do is that you do it yourself and you put an honest effort. And you know what? There's no way for me to check if someone is going to, I heard the word cheat. So I'm not going to use that. I just used it anyways. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> if you don't do it yourself, you don't, if you don't put honest effort, you might get a good mark uh, on the test. You might get a good mark on the uh, final, as a final grade, but what are you going to do with that? It's going to be useless. You're going to have your paper. You're going to have your diploma. You can just hang it on your wall. Good luck. I just want to mention one thing here. Um, this on this whole online thing that has that just happened in the last uh, uh, over a year because of the COVID-related uh, uh, restrictions and whatnot, it has shifted the way we teach. It has shifted the way we learn. I want you to be aware of one very important thing. Once you get the paper, once you get the diploma, it is it, it will not mean as much to the employer that is going to hire you. Yes, it's going to be a gateway, you know, a way to enter uh, the environment, but just uh, ju just think about it. All the employers, they know what has happened in the edu educational environment, that some of those things went online. And sometimes uh, uh, when it comes to evaluation and learning, sometimes people might get marks that they don't deserve. Uh, there's no way to escape that as much as we try the hardest to give, uh, to, 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 to reflect the learning process as much as you can. But uh, the online thing is not in-person thing, okay? Now, by the same token, if you put an honest effort, it doesn't matter whether you're in person, theory classes, okay? Then the labs, the practical, uh, yeah, it's okay, you can walk. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, so, um, um, Thank you, uh, where was I? So, yeah, if you put an honest effort in the theory classes, then it doesn't matter whether it's online or in person, my humble opinion, okay? Uh, but, uh, The employers, they know that. So once you get hired, they will watch you. Okay. So there's no way. Either way, you have to put an honest effort. And once you walk out the door from our school, well, uh, you're going to be on your own. You're not going to have uh, your friend to tell you the answer to some things. You're not going to have me to ask questions. You are just going to be you and yourself uh, to, uh, and the knowledge that you got, all right? So uh, as far as the little bit of a motivational speech, <laughs> if you will, all right? Okay, so now uh, let's just quickly go over some of the, some of the stuff that we have uh, learned. First, uh, we have learned the uh, synchronous generator. And let's just skip, skim through some of the, um, some of the, uh, oh, can we do this? No, that's not it. Give me a sec here. There, I'm gonna queue it up. And last time the, uh, some of the equipment was giving me some grief here, but uh, let's see if that is going to be working fine now. Yeah, it seems like we're changing the slides. So synchronous generator, working principle, and so on. Uh, okay, uh, pretty uh, forward, uh, pretty forward stuff. Converting a generator. First of all, the generator converts uh, mechanical power to generate electricity, and that's basically how uh, that basic, that's basically how things work. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, synchronous rotor stators. Uh, okay, synchronous rotor, and uh, because it's a synchronous operation, so rotor 
and the stator they have um, the same uh, they have the same speed all right uh, stator speed stator magnetic field rotates okay rotor and stator field at different speed asynchronous machines uh, induction motor mechanical power uh, uh, converting mechanical power to the three phase electricity all right uh, where things are used, primary sources of electrical energy, power stations, hydro, thermal, and nuclear. Uh, yeah, so hydro, uh, thermal, and the nuclear um, uh, power plants. It's uh, it's all coming down to um, to what to make some to make the generator spin. How are you going to make it spin? You have to generate heat. Whether you're going to generate the heat by burning coal, or you're going to generate the heat by uh, by using the uh, hydro or you know some waterfall, uh, uh, or you're going to use the nuclear reactor to uh, to generate heat. It the the, the heat makes uh, the steam go, and the steam makes the turbine spin or rotate, and that's how we are getting the uh, that's how we are getting the mechanical power that we're going to turn into the electrical power when it comes to generating electricity all right uh, <clears throat> all right uh we're going to skip that uh because we well we have talked about it so uh it's pretty much self-explanatory what is on this diagram well maybe we should uh this is the hydro example so there's the water falling down making the turbine spin here's the synchronous generator it is spinning the rotor is spinning generating the electromagnetic field the magnetic field induces the power uh induces the emf in the stator and the stator outputs the electrical power and through the wires it is delivered to your home so you can uh, you can warm up your toast in your favorite toaster okay now here is the same thing uh, as far as the thermal power station so uses natural uh, gas or oil or coal uh, then uh, then the whole idea is again to spin the rotor all right uh, how is it accomplished either this way or that way the idea is to spin the rotor in the uh, synchronous generator okay? uh, working principle well um uh, here's our magnetic field. Here is the conductor. And uh, if you expose the conductor into a changing magnetic field, an EMF is going to be uh, uh, induced. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to stop here for a sec here. I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Do we understand the difference between the EMF and a voltage drop? Or you know, I still have to say voltage drop. Uh, and you know what? Uh, go ahead, guys. You don't need to type. You can just go on voice. That's fine. Uh, speak freely. Uh, feel free to uh, to join. Uh, you know, pipe in anytime. Okay. So uh, the difference between EM or the EMF and uh, and the uh, voltage drop across a resistor, for example, um, we have talked about it a few times. Let's see who who remembers what. Okay. Anybody difference between a gen, uh, uh, EMF and a voltage drop. Come on. I'm going to sip, I'm going to, sip, I'm going to get a sip of my coffee. Hopefully you got yours. Everybody awake? Is everybody following this thing? Or did you just turn this thing on and watching TV? Right? Or did this thing freeze on me? I want someone to respond. <laughs> okay. Well, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Somebody spoke. That's good. That's my cue that I can. Uh, all right. So EMF and a voltage drop. EMF. If we have a, um, uh, if we have a conductor, all right, and that conductor is exposed to magnetic field or magnetic flux. Actually, that conductor is exposed to magnetic field, and whatever acts on this conductor 
is going to be considered as magnetic flux. Everything else is the magnetic field. The stuff that is acting on that conductor is going to be uh, considered as uh, the flux. It's the effective magnetic field, the, the, the magnetic field that we're interested in. Right? So magnetic uh, field becomes, well, it's considered as magnetic flux. And if that is moving across it, which means if this, if that, if this conductor is moving across that magnetic field, let's say this was this was uh, north, and this was south pole here. Okay. Um, now, uh, when we when we have a motion, when the conductor is in motion, if the conductor stands still, nothing is going to happen. It's just going to sit there, and things are going to be just. Um, as they are, nothing is going to be generated, nothing is going to be affected. As soon as we start moving that, right, when the motion is introduced, then we're exposing that conductor into a changing magnetic field. Um, uh, and uh, what is going to happen is that electromotive force is going to, um, electromotive force is going to be uh, introduced into, um, into, this, uh, um, into this conductor, okay? Now, uh, what, we're have, what, we, what we want is uh, we were, we're going to uh, have, whenever we have that, there is going to be a current flow in the conductor that is going to produce. It's going to produce an opposite magnetic field to whatever it is, right? So let's say this conductor is that conductor right here, and it's moving this way into this field. So that side of the conductor is, um, is going to meet that field first. So this side of, if you magnify that, all right? Uh, so the field is acting this way on this conductor. So the, the field that's going to oppose that, uh, uh, that magnetic field, it's going to be this way here, all right? So the change is happening this way, all right? So some sort of magnetic field is going to be around that. Which way is it going to go? Right. It is going to go to oppose the change. So the field, the change goes this way. It goes up because this side becomes more north. So the change of the magnetic field around this uh, conductor that's exposed to is going to go up. So the conductor is going to come up with the opposite way to, uh, to basically, because I don't want any change, right? Uh, so it's going to have to come up with one that opposes that, that's going down. So it's going to spin around the conductor this way, all right? Now, if you use the right-hand rule, which basically you grab the conductor with, uh, just grab it and point it with your, with your thumb, that is going to um, point the positive, well, actually it's going to point the direction of the current, all right? So um, uh, if you grab uh, that, so what we have here, we have this thing going this way, all right? This thing, this magnetic field is going to go around the conductor this way here, all right? Uh, and if you grab a uh, this conductor with your right hand, and I'm not going to draw it because today I, I think my drawing skills are, 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 are kind of out the window, but I'm going to use my right hand because I'm filming myself through a mirror. So this is my right hand, really. It looks like my left hand, but I'm going to grab that conductor with my right hand like this. Um, so that means this uh, the current is going to flow that way. All right, so the current is going to flow this way here. That's the current. All right, so we have that. Right. That's the right hand rule. Now, here comes, here comes in play the difference between EMF and a voltage drop. Let's say, all right, let's say we have a wire connected from this into a resistor with the designation of R. All right. So how is the current going to flow? We, did, we just found out that it's going to go this way. So this is going to be the X. And on the other side, it's going to be a dot. Right? Uh, so the current flows this way, the current flows this way, the current flows this way. And a resistor, of course, the current is going to flow. And we're talking about the conventional current flow. We're just going to stick to one thing, conventional current flow. If you want to convert everything to the um, electron flow, go ahead. But you have to stick 
to that all the way through, but we're going to conventional current flow. So in conventional current flow, in a voltage drop, things are happening from plus to minus. So this is the more positive, this is going to go from here to here through the resistor. So of course, this is going to be more positive. It's going to be, excuse me, more negative way or excuse me, less negative, less positive way of this resistor. Okay, so we have the polarity. Now we can just go apply the polarity here and apply the polarity here. It's plus, here's minus. Okay. So an EMF, electromotive force, EMF, and here's voltage drop. In EMF, EMF is considered an electromotive force. EMF is just like making a power supply out of this conductor. And a voltage drop is on the receiving end of a load. So in a voltage drop, the current flows from the positive to the negative side. In EMF, as it is a power supply, it's just like making a temporary battery out of this conductor. Of course, this is going to be positive, this is going to be negative, and the current, of course, is going to flow this way. So in an EMF source, the current flows from the negative to the positive, considering a conventional current flow, all right? So EMF is a source. It's just like a battery, electromotive force. And the voltage drop is uh, on the receiving end. The voltage drop is what the load is receiving. Okay. I want you to know the difference between and see, notice, hint, hint, I'm stressing on that, right? Do you think I might ask you something like that uh, um, in, uh, uh, on the upcoming test? I think I will, right? So get the idea, the difference between EMF, which is electromotive force and the voltage drop. It is going to be very beneficial to you to know that because you will be there, if, if you end up working in this field, you will need to know the difference between the EMF and the voltage drop. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's go back to this thing here. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, see, somebody spoke. Uh, doesn't matter if you can say, I don't know. That's okay. That's why I'm here to explain this. That's why this is called school. But if nobody says anything, I'm just going to wait until somebody says something. <laughs> and saying, I don't know, it's okay too. Right. Don't be afraid to say that. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, okay. So we just covered that. So if the if the conductor is uh, uh, moving across the, uh, I, I keep coming back to this idea. I'm drilling that thing into you because I want you to get this in your blood stream. As I keep saying, this is my one of my famous sayings. All right. Uh, this needs to be part of your DNA. All right. Uh, if somebody. Uh, uh, 100 years from now, if they want to get a sample of your DNA, they're going to find out, oh, what is this? Uh, all right, uh, here's some kind of a North and South Pole, and there's a conductor going on there. What's up with that? That's what I want to accomplish. Right? Now, uh, so the EMF, electromotive force, is going to be equal to the strength of the magnetic field, and that's in Tesla's. And the length of the conductor that is uh, exposed to the um, uh, to the magnetic field, and the velocity, uh, which is going to be the velocity. Here's the key thing to the velocity: it has to be the velocity that is perpendicular at a ninety degree to the direction of the magnetic field. So whenever you are calculating a rotating device, you're going to have to find out. Not how fast is it spinning uh, from the how fast it's spinning in a circle, but you're going to have to find out how fast it's actually moving across the field. Okay, so that's the that's the key. So that's the velocity, and the velocity is in um, uh, meters per second. Okay. All right. So uh, Tesla's length is meters, velocity meters per second, and that's the velocity that is across the, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field at the right angle of the magnetic field lines, right? And then based on the right hand rule, just uh, grab a conductor. Oh, this is my left hand, but it looks like my right hand. Grab it that this is the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field around the conductor, and this is going to be pointing the direction of the current in conventional current flow. 
Okay? Uh, so, and of course, the voltage drop as well as the EMF is expressed in volts. Okay? Um, and one of the formulas, that's one of the formulas. Uh, the other one is the delta, delta flux over delta time. And of course, uh, this is uh, just, uh, just uh, as a reminder, this is per one. This is per one conductor's length. So if you have a coil exposed to magnetic field, If that's a coil uh, and it's affected by the magnetic field, so here is length of one conductor, here's the length of the other conductor. If that conductor moves this way uh, closer to the North Pole, this is going to move closer to the South Pole, but it's going to move the other way. So those things are going to add. So if you have a coil, single coil, it's going to be the length of this conductor plus the length of this conductor. Okay. So that's why uh, here. That's why we would we're going to have to have the uh, n here number of turns, right? And the turn, a single turn, is going to be two lengths, right? So this is going to be if it's a coil, it's going to be two times BLV, and if of course if that uh, if that rotor has two hundred turns, you're still going to have to multiply it by two hundred. Hint, hint, okay? I might ask a question like that, all right? All right. Uh, now, <clears throat> we have done some calculations and you know what, next time we see each other, we're going to tackle this thing one last time. Uh, here, see this two times because uh, there's one single conductor and there's only one turn. Uh, if you have 200 turns, the whole thing has to be multiplied by the... Uh, by a number of turns, and there's the that, that's omega t. That's the angular velocity, because when things are moving in circle, we have to consider the angular velocity, and from that angular velocity, we have to calculate the linear velocity, which means the velocity that the conductors are cutting the magnetic field perpendicular to the way that the magnetic field is cutting it through. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that we're going to have an example or two just to remind, so we retain uh, the information. I know that uh, you guys are going through a bunch of other courses, and some of them are math heavy. So I know how it is. You have to switch your mental gears from one thing to another. It's not easy, you know. But you know what? Uh, it's just uh, it's just a couple more weeks here. Okay. So uh, just uh, just think about it. Once once uh, once this is done, you'll be able to catch your breath. At least the mental type of breath. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, we're going to tackle that later on. Stator and rotor with the um, uh, with the synchronous generator. Now those uh, uh, those the windings uh, are 120 degrees apart. So over here, if I can just uh, zoom this in a little bit, maybe. Uh, There, okay. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, somebody did a really nice job of coloring the windings. Uh, now look at this. Here's the stator of the synchronous machine, right? This could be used as a motor or this could be used as a generator, but this is the stator inside of which a rotor goes. The windings of the stator are separated 120 degree, degrees apart. So here is one winding. And here's the other pole of this winding. All right, so here is basically one winding set of windings right here. And then 120 degrees apart, there's another one. All right. And 100 degrees, 20 degrees apart is another one. All right. And they're arranged in a certain way that uh, the you get the most efficient. Um, most uh, efficient operation as far as generating or receiving three phase uh, electricity, right? Three phase uh, current flow. 
that uh, is going to create the magnetic field that is revolving around the whole stator. Now, <coughs> um, how many poles would this be if this was a rotor? Okay. Um, there's one set of windings, which is going to have north and south pole. So the blue ones, for example, I wish this thing would not appear as I am uh, pointing my mouse. Um, then, so okay, so one set of windings has two poles, north and south. So one set of windings is going to produce two poles. We have three sets of windings. So this here, we can say that uh, we have six poles here. Six, north, uh, three north poles and three south poles. That's the idea of uh, having the stator windings being physically separated uh, by 120 degrees apart. And that's basically when the motor is wound. That's what it looks like right here. All right. Um, magnetic field, two, two ways of, uh, of uh, having the um, synchronous machine operate. We could have a permanent magnet, or we could have uh, uh, we could have the field winding. Now we could. Uh, how does uh, uh, do we remember how is it that the uh, synchronous machine works? It works based on induction, right? Um, but it's a synchronous type of a machine. What makes a synchronous machine synchronous? What does it? what is it that it separates that from an induction machine just a plain old induction machine the difference between an induction motor let's say and a synchronous motor we're going to switch gears and we're going to switch from generators to motors right now okay what is it that makes that thing work uh can somebody uh say something sooner somebody says something even if he says i don't know uh i know that you guys are participating all right what is it that uh separates the basic difference between synchronous motor and the induction motor. Name one thing, name one difference between these two. Somebody come on voice. All right. It's okay, speak up. Rotor and stator speed. Okay, uh, there we go. So we have rotor and stator speed. What about the rotor and stator speed uh, when it comes to dealing with synchronous machine and the induction machine? That's a very good, that's a very good thing here. Thank you, Yangon Kim, by the way. All right. All right. Jiga Kumar, thank you. I hope I pronounced your name right. Same in synchronous, question mark. And, um, Yangon Kim says uh, synchronous machine has the same rotor and stator speed. That's very good. Okay, that's uh, that's right. right. That's what makes it synchronous. Right. And the induction motor. Uh, what's happening in induction motor? Uh, of course, the uh, the synchronous uh, the synchronous speed does. Okay, um, the term as far as terminology. Do, do we have a synchronous speed in induction motor as well as the um, synchronous motor? Are we going, is, is the synchronous speed going to exist in both of them? It's almost a trick question. <clears throat> Are we going to deal with something that's called a synchronous speed in both cases? Yes or no? Just give me yes or no. I'm drilling you guys today, am I? Yeah, we have different. Uh, we have different speed slip. Synchronous machine has the same rotor and stator speed, and there is uh, the uh, Yongon Kim says. Um, there is a word that, 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 that you have used. It says slip. 
but where does the slip apply? Does the slip apply to synchronous machine or does it apply to an induction motor? Induction, there we go. All right, good, that's very good, induction motor. Actually, if we use induction motor, um, if, you, if you use the induction machine, if we have something that's called a wire wound rotor, then we are going to deal with um, uh, we're going to deal with a, a different type of slip, right? Because, because I was getting ahead of myself. What is the slip? First of all, what's a slip? So we found out the slip only applies to the induction motor. Okay. Slip does not apply to synchronous motor. So what is it, that mysterious slip? And that's okay, you can type if you want. Um, or you can just you can just say it as well. Mm -hmm. All right. What's the slip? Go and get your juices going. Get your brain juices going. The difference between rotor and stator speed. All right, thank you. Yangon came again. All right. So when it comes to a motor, is the rotor going to spin faster or slower then? Okay, so I'm answering the question that I asked before. All right. We kind of uh, got a little bit sidetracked, but we're coming back on the on the proper railings right now. So what is a synchronous speed? Does it exist in both cases? Do, are we dealing with synchronous speed, both in synchronous machine and induction machine? Do we have that exist? Does it exist? Yes or no? Does it exist in both cases or just one case? Yes. All right, so uh, the uh, synchronous, what's the synchronous speed? And we'll talk about synchronous speed. We'll, uh, we'll, let's just uh, say that we're going to do with the motor. Forget the generator for now. Right? So what would be the synchronous speed? both. So we have established that we have the synchronous speed exists in the induction motor and the synchronous speed exists in the synchronous motor. Right? What is that synchronous speed? What Can you describe it? All right, so here's the formula for that. And the formula is 120 times the frequency uh, and uh, divided by the number of poles. Okay, so can you describe what it is? If you just if you just had to if somebody on the street stops you excuse me sir what's a synchronous speed how would you describe it in in, in words or if somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night what's your what's a synchronous speed or if you're going to win million dollars and somebody's going to ask you a skilled question you can get a million dollars but you have to answer that one question. What's a synchronous speed? <laughs> Even if somebody says, I don't know, I'm okay. Somebody speak. No, I don't really know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Somebody spoke. All right, the synchronous speed, if you apply, remember those uh, three windings in the stator that are separated 120 degrees, degrees apart? 
right? So uh, here, Yang and Kim, uh, okay, the speed at which the magnetic field changes, uh, the speed at which the magnetic field rotates. Right? So when we have three, um, three sets of windings, one, two, and three, and let's say they are separated um, 120 degrees apart physically. Right? And if we apply AC power to all three of them, but they're going to be, well, 120 degrees apart, then we're going to have the field. We're going to, we're going to create a rotating magnetic field. It's just like going to be a, an imaginary we're going to create an imaginary we're going to create an imaginary magnet that rotates and when we apply ac power with the separation of 120 degrees and the three phases phase one phase two phase three is going to be 120 degrees apart as far as timing is concerned, then we're going to create a rotating magnetic field. We're creating an imaginary magnet, right? So that is the synchronous speed. Now, um, synchronous motor has a stator that is made like that. And induction motor has a stator that also is made the same way. So when we apply the three phase power the same way to this one and to that one, we're going to accomplish that rotating magnetic field in both cases. Yeah. So yes, we're going to deal with something that's called a synchronous speed. Where the differences, where the differences between the synchronous motor and the induction motor is that the synchronous motor is going to have uh, inside that rotating magnetic field is going to have a highly magnetized rotor that let's say this is north and this is south and this is north and this is south it's going to lock on to that because opposites attract so the north side of the rotor is going to lock on to the south pole of that imaginary rotating magnet, which will be the, the rotating field, and the south pole of this is going to lock on to the north. They're going to attract each other, they're going to stay, they're going to hang on for dear life, right? So when, uh, <clears throat> when this rotating magnetic field spins, that thing is going to spin right with it. Okay? In the synchronous machine, those forces of attraction are so strong that they're going to stay and lock on to each other and that thing is not going to change. It has to stay that way. The rotating magnetic field is going to pull the rotor with it at the same speed that it rotates. Okay. Right. Now, when we put more load to it, when we load that motor, make it make it work harder the speed of the, ro the rotational speed of the rotor is not going to change it's still going to try to keep up and it's going to keep up with the rotating magnetic field if it becomes too much what is going to happen If the load of the if the load that is posed to the synchronous motor is too much for the motor to handle, what is going to happen? Remember, we have electrical energy transferred to the mechanical energy. So if we have to spin something so hard that the motor can't keep up with this with the power demands what's going to happen to the motor when it's a synchronous motor are you going to burn out the windings yep you're going to burn out the windings because 
it is going to try to keep up with the speed. And if it can't keep up with the speed, things are going to disengage those poles of the router and the magnetic field are going to disengage from each other. That thing is, won't, this won't be, this, this mag rotating magnetic field won't be able to pull this router anymore and the thing is just going to stop. Okay. That's the synchronous machine. I know we're coming to, uh, we're, we're getting close. You have another class to go to, but if I can get this one more concept with you, how is that going to be different with the induction machine? At some point, yes, you can make the induction machine stop as well. Yes, there is a threshold to everything. Everything has its own limits, right? But what I'm trying to say here is that when you have a synchronous motor, you increase the load, the speed is still going to be the same as the synchronous speed. The speed of the rotor is still going to be the same as the rotating magnetic field. It is just the coils are going to draw more current to keep up with the demand. When it comes to synchronous, uh, yeah, synchronous, when it comes to induction machine, first of all, what do we have inside the induction machine? We could have two types of rotors in the induction machine. And the two types would be See if my drawing skills. What did I just draw? Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel, this is a squirrel. Okay, so, <laughs> so we have squirrel cage and a wound motor. Let's just take care of, just forget the wound, uh, wire wound motor. Let's uh, take care of the squirrel cage. So now what we have is we have a squirrel cage. Quickly, 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 quickly. All right, almost done for today. All right, so here is, if I can draw it here, and here, so we have, yeah, here's a squirrel cage drum that we're going to have some sort of a pivotal mounting here and we're going to put uh, we're going to mount it on something and let's say we're going to have bearings here so you could have that all right so these would be the metal rods and here is going to be a rotating magnetic field so that rotating magnetic field is going to cut through those metal rods at certain speed it's going to generate EMF, remember? It's going to make EMF source, electromotive force. Um, it's going to generate EMF in those rods. And if the EMF is generated in the rod, metal rod, we're going to have a spike of current happening in that rod. And we have the current, we're going to have magnetic field, two magnetic fields are going to crash, something is going to happen. What's going to happen? It's going to have motion happening. It's going to try to push that rod that way straight, but it can't push it straight because it's on an axle. So it's going to make it rotate. And then the next one comes and the next one comes and the next one comes. So that rotating magnetic field is just going to cut through those at a certain speed, generating the, um, generating the EMF and thus generating the torque. It's the force of the, the, the motion, the force of the motion. 
So that is just free spinning device. And we can put something here and we could make, we can put some sort of a mechanical load to spin, whatever that is. First of all, we already have established that there is something that's called a synchronous speed that exists in the induction machine because we have the rotating magnetic field that is not going to change. The, the, the synchronous speed is there. Then you're going to have the rotational speed of the drum. Now, if that rotor moved at the same speed as the synchronous speed, which means those metal rods are going to be synchronized with the imaginary magnet that is spinning, which means if they're spinning at the same speed, it's just if they were standing still because that magnetic field is not going to be changing across that. So then the torque is going to disappear. This thing is not going to want to spin. So it's going to disengage from the force of the spinach, right? And as it slows down, those speeds are going to be different, just enough for that magnetic field to be changing again, that is applied to those rods. And once it's changing again, it's going to create a little bit of the EMF, which is going to create a torque. So this rotor is never, ever, ever going to rotate at the same speed as the synchronous speed, because once it does, it just stops having the force. The force disappears. Once the speed is different, then we're dealing with the um, with the changing magnetic field applied to those rods one at a time or a few at a time. And then again, we're going to have, so it's going we're going to have the motion happening. So this rotor is always going to be slower than. It's going to be slower than the rotating magnetic field. And the difference between those two speeds, we're going to call a slip. Now, what's going to happen when the load becomes harder to pull by the rotor in the induction machine? Just one last question before you go. What's going to happen when the load becomes harder to pull inside the squirrel cage motor? You can say one way or the other, or you can say, I don't know. Somebody say something. Doesn't the torque increase for the motor or is, am I thinking the wrong thing? Like when you add a bigger load, won't the motor output more torque to compensate? <laughs> Yeah, you want to compensate with the torque, so you would probably have to, uh, if you want to keep up the same speed, or as you increase the load, then uh, then you're going to have to compensate with the power supply uh, into the rotating magnetic field in order to, uh, to, to keep the speed, right? So that's good. But, so here, that's a good way of thinking. But if the power stays the same, that's supplied to the magnetic field or the rotating magnetic field. By the same token, if you make this load harder to pull, it is going to slow it down. It's going to spin slower, slightly slower. So the slip is going to increase as the load becomes harder to pull. Right? So that's the difference between the induction motor and the synchronous motor. The synchronous motor, the speed never going, is never going to change. It's going to try to keep up no matter what happens with the synchronous, with the induction motor, because we just have that free spinning drum here. We have the freedom of, well, it, it does have the freedom to slow down. It's always going to be slower. All right, so we're going to leave as, uh, um, we're going to leave as it is right now, and we're going to pick it up uh, next time we see each other, and I'm going to see a group of you in, uh, in the lab.
All right, cool. All right, enjoy the rest of the day, guys, and uh, I'll see you when I see you. Thank you very much.